So we will begin tonight with... So we only have one agenda item tonight, the Gale Associates contract. So I heard from some members of the public as well as some members of the board that they were interested in reconsidering and discussing whether we wanted to get three, to go out for bid. So at this point, if that was something people were interested in, the process would be that we, there would be a motion to reconsider the vote on January 24th. And then, then after that, it would be, once that vote was reconsidered, we, we say yes, after that, then people could, e could vote to say no, we don't want to do that, or yes, we can. Yes would end it, and no would mean that we would then not, we would then not be using Gale anymore, and then that would be given up as an opening to seek com to have a new motion, which would be to go out for competitive bid. So that is our option that's on the table, and since a couple of people reached out to me, I thought it was worth having a brief meeting because we were meeting anyway, so that we had that option. And still, we're able to keep the facilities process going. So uh, I know I wasn't here last week, um, so I don't know if I am even able to vote on the first first part of that, but um, I guess my question would be is how feasible would it be and timely would it be to put out three bids? Um, so I don't know if the administration would be able to answer that um, and what the expectations around that would be if we were to go back out and try and get two additional bids, um, how feasible that would be and, and would that change um, the outcome is, is obviously um, one big part, but yeah. So we are prepared to go out to bid tomorrow. We're, um, we're just finalizing our RFP that would go out. And um, we would likely keep, set the date probably um, two to three weeks, and then they would have um, a time that Jeremy would set up with any of the uh, people who are interested in um, bidding on the project, and he would do a walkthrough <coughs> of the three properties, South Range, Dairy Village, and West Running Brook, so that he would only have to do the walkthrough once, and he's already done it with one firm. So he would do that, and then we would give them a couple weeks to prepare their bid, and then it would um, come back here for consideration. So we're trying in all that to get it to the uh, first or second meeting in March. More likely the second meeting in March, just with the holiday, uh, the vacation. So does anyone else have any questions or would anyone like to reconsider? I'll make the motion to reconsider the vote of last week with Gail and Associates. So I'm just going to amend it per what Gordon said, which is I move to reconsider the board's January 24th, 2023 vote to approve an amount of 15950 for West Running Brook Middle School for Gale Associates, 14150 for South Range Elementary School, and the amount of 17135 for the Dairy Village Elementary School. So a motion is on the... Is there a second? Is there any discussion? If not, we will take a. We'll Erica, take, yeah. where was this posted? It was posted yesterday on our website within 24 hours, as required. Two places. Two places. Put your mic on, Austin. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it is posted on the website. It's posted at the SAU, and uh, Pauline uh, puts it up in the lobby. Uh, I think the entrance way. There's some kind. Of, according to Kathleen, there's some uh, place in the um, entrance way that it gets hung. So I guess my point is, who sees it at the SAU or even at West Brook, right? People are not happy with us. It just keeps happening over and over again that we're disappointing people and they think we're hiding things and they think we're being dishonest. 
and it doesn't feel right. So I really think we need to think about, first of all, not making j snap decisions to do these kind of things, but the other thing is we need to think about where we're posting. Send it to the town hall and, or the municipal center. They'll post it in their, their thing. People look at that when they go to register their cars and pay their taxes and walk through and whatever. Send it to the library. We used to post there. We used to post in every single school so people saw it. I know it's a pain. I know it's paper that gets printed, but it's important for people to know what we're doing and what our intent is. And I, I'm disappointed that we're sitting here. I almost didn't come because I don't feel right about it. So I do appreciate what you're saying, but we did post it in two spots. So there is a there is a motion and a second on the table. Are people ready to vote? Who all in favor of reconsidering the January 24th, 2023rd vote? I will do a roll call. I'll start with David. Yes. Jessica? Yes. Brenda? No. Paul? No. Derek? No. Paul? I mean, sorry, John? No. The chair votes yes. So now we have a motion. So now we are, we have a, we have now voted to reconsider by a vote of four to three. So at this point, we will, we will consider the motion and I will make the motion for the purposes of discussion. There's a motion to approve the amount of $15,950,000 for West Running Brook Middle School for Gale Associates, $14,150 for South Range Elementary School, and the amount of $17,135 for Dairy Village Elementary School. We will now, there's, and do I have a second? So we have what the law says that if we reconsider a motion, we have to vote to reconsider and then re-vote on the motion. So I'll speak since I did, I heard from people in the public and I heard from members of the board at the last meeting and I think we should go out for bid and make sure that we have, that we have done our due diligence to make sure that we have all the information and the public can see we're working hard to figure out what is going on with the envelope because we cannot fix anything if we don't know what's wrong. Would anyone else like to speak before? I don't know if this is exactly what I heard at the last meeting, but I think someone requested they wanted to vote on the RFP. Does anybody remember that request? Because that would further delay things if that was the case of, does anybody want to vote on an RFP? Okay, I guess that changed. Um, thank you. I, um, I voted uh, initially um, to uh, appropriate the money and hire Gail, and I, I, uh, I spoke in favor of it um, for a couple of reasons, and um, those reasons uh, still are um, valid, um, but they don't uh, override um, the fact that we've established the procedure that we um, are supposed to go by, and I think that, um, you know, if that plays out in the way that... Uh, it should, um, we'll end up getting um, the services that we decide that are appropriate at the time. Um, you know, oftentimes we hear about the lowest bid. Uh, make no mistake um, for anybody that's listening that the lowest bid isn't always the best bid. Um, if we had, for instance, a bid that came in uh, $2,000 less than what the Gale Associate is, and that firm was to provide us uh, no track record and say we've never done one of these before, it'll be our first one, and there's no reference and no established uh, track record, then that savings of uh, $2,000 would be a fool's errand, obviously. Um, but if we were to have somebody come in and say that they have, <coughs> they have references and they've done these things before, and um, then obviously you'd go with the, uh, the financial uh, savings. But um, the... Um, the initial vote we had last week, um, I, I, I will uh, concur with what Erica said. Um, I, I did receive um, some feedback from people, um, and uh, oftentimes, um, if I have <coughs> if I have a position that I feel um, I feel that uh, is a strong position, I'll defend it. But I really didn't feel that that was a strong position. I felt that uh, after the fact, um, certainly, yes, we were uh, under the gun, so to speak, to um, 
to uh, expedite this process. A lot of people have said that uh, it's taking forever and things like that. So here was a three week um, or so um, window that we could remove. Um, we also um, have the, uh, the employment issue where we have people that, um, where we have positions that we don't have people for, and especially the skilled ones that are um, we needed to do something like this. So all those things um, I think are still valid, but we don't know um, who's out there in terms of uh, firms that are able to do this. And I think that um, to put the bid out there with the, um, uh, with the, uh, with the solicitation to, uh, to come forward and, and uh, complete this task and give us a price for it, I think is incumbent upon us. And I think that the most motion, blah, blah, motion to reconsider was a good one. And um, I think that um, this is one of the things that when people say, we don't listen to what you say, well, yeah, we do. And, um, and if um, we think that maybe we could have done a better job, we try. So that's my, uh, that's my input into this. I was one of the yes votes last time and to pretty much echo what Paul said. Uh, for the same reasons I heard from people, um, there were two members of our board who showed hesitation. One voted yes, one voted no. I think that if we want to establish goodwill with our constituents and show them that we are listening, I'm not in favor of delaying things, but if this, we lose a few months, it's small in the big picture that this is a cost that is absolutely necessary in our five to 10 year facilities plan that Jeremy needs in order to go forward. Um, I, that's why I was willing to reconsider this vote because people asked and I'm on board with it. Would anyone else like to speak before we vote? If not, we will take a roll call vote and go the other way. John? So just to be clear, this is a vote for the contract. So voting, yes, it's the same vote as last week. I will vote yes. Derek? Um, so I voted no previous, previously and my reasoning was because the overwhelming feedback that I've been receiving over the past year has been that we're delaying things too long. Um, I did receive a couple of emails um, for the fact that we didn't go out to bid on three small contracts. Um, but in the interest of, I'm, I'm not going to be here in, in March, so in the interest of giving the board as much um, public capital as I can, I will vote no. Paul? No. Brenda? I think I'm clear on what we're voting on. What contract are we We're voting on? We're voting on whether we want to hire Gail. Okay, no. No. David? No. And the chair votes no, so that motion fails. So at this point, the next motion, and I will make it, is I move to ask the administration to seek competitive bids and or proposals for qualifying companies to do an in-depth assessment of the building envelope at Dairy Village Elementary School, South Range Elementary School, and West Running Brook Middle School, and to propose solutions to those moisture penetration issues with the consultant hired to be on site while the work is being done to analyze the moisture issues. I'll second. And like Derek, I, I feel it's important that, and Jessica, that we have goodwill with the community and people know we're working very hard on trying to move forward facilities, but this is an area where we need to get more information and I think we need to, I, I feel it's important to get, to show the community we do listen and that we want to get the right information and make sure we have it. So is there any discussion at this point? So now I've provided the board with their public capital. I will make my own opinion on this subject. And that is the following, that I believe the people that are pushing back on this particular contract are simply trying to snowball this effort. I think they've been doing it for a couple of years now because they have one thing and only one thing in their mind is that is to not have consolidation in our district. So uh, we'll play the game, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll go out to bid. Um, but I can foresee many other hurdles being thrown in the road for this board, uh, for the next board that will convene. At this point, if, even if the group of three bids get back to us before school break, most likely we're not going to vote on that at the March 7th meeting because the new board is going to sit at the next meeting. Um, so that's going to delay things by a few more months. 
most likely any of those contractors are going to be scheduled most likely through summer at that point so we probably won't get numbers until later in the year um, and then we'll have to go back to fiscal advisory and explain why we don't have any numbers yet so um, that is my personal opinion not of the board so does anyone else have anything to say before we vote I'm pretty sure that's what I said at the last vote that we need to keep finding goodwill with the community and when we have a policy that says we go to bid for five thousand dollars and we ignore that we don't even take the time to suspend that we just go ahead with a forty seven thousand dollar bid one it's wrong so I, and I don't I do think people have gotten to the point where the trust level is difficult for us and they are going to keep questioning and I think any of us that are, were out in the audience would be doing the same thing just to be clear, because I do follow policies, we did not break the policy. There's two words, when feasible, and we were within our grounds. But I do want good trust with the community. Is there, would anyone else like to speak before we vote? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I actually agree with a lot of what Derek said, and I think the straw men that we, we're creating of these people um, that are, are, that are wanting to, quote, build goodwill um, is disingenuous um, and these delays are going to negatively affect the the betterment of the facilities w one way or the other whichever way you believe it's delaying and there are going to be negative consequences for this um, so uh, it is what it is but um, that's that, those are my feelings as well I am not a straw person, and I do believe we need to build goodwill. That didn't come from anybody else. That came from me. At this point, is everyone ready to vote? If so, we'll start on the other side with David. So the vote is to seek competitive bids. Yes. Jessica? Yes. Brenda? Paul? Yes. Derek? Yes. John? Yes. And the chair votes yes. The motion passes. So at this point, that is the only agenda item on the on for tonight. So at this point, we, as in all public meetings, we do have delegations and individuals, but the only thing you are allowed to speak to is the Gale Associates bid and only the Gale Associates bid. Does anyone want to speak at this time? If not, I would take a motion to close the public meeting. In a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. At this time, we are now opening the facilities workshop. The purpose of this workshop is to present information for the administration to present its proposal on the reconfiguration, on a potential reconfiguration of the district that they support so that the board can hear the proposal and ask all questions. So I will pass the mic now to Austin. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, disclaimer. <laughs> um, what happens when one meeting gets canceled and then another meeting gets canceled, all of this, uh, the packet you have in front of you, all of the slides are in there. But I apologize, I'm not going to guarantee that they are all in the correct order. But um, uh, we will make sure that um, once we get through this, uh, the correct order is posted. Um, on the uh, website, uh, Cliff is going to be running um, the um, presentation on the on the cameras and what's going to go over through Jonathan there on television. And I just ask those of you there here and also of you presenting, if you were expecting your slide to come up and we've moved that around in all of our different meetings we've had, please adapt. Okay? All right. So... If we could put up the title slide, along with myself to present, and I apologize, I don't know what's going on with my voice. It comes and goes as it so pleases. So uh, it's, uh, to me, it's very more, more aggravating than normal. <laughs> so I do apologize for the 
scratchiness, and so forth. Along with myself, the presenters of this PowerPoint include Joseph Crawford, Assistant Superintendent, Jane Samad, Business Administrator, Kathy Kennedy, Director of Human Resources, Dr. Cliff Dancy, Director of Information Systems, Laura Powers, Director of Student Services, Kim Conan was going to be here tonight, but she's at a Title I um, conference with a couple of our principals from the Title I schools. Um, of course, school board, you want to ask, you want to interrupt and ask a question, you can do that. My suggestion is we jot down questions, get through the presentation, and then we can um, ask those questions. Our charge. We have been asked by the school board, and in the past, the Fiscal Advisory Committee, to consider scenarios that would substantially decrease expenses without compromising the quality of education our students receive. <clears throat> As has been stressed by some members of the Fiscal Advisory Committee and School Board, unless there are significant reductions our budget is financially unsustainable. There is pressure to reduce spending in both present and future budgets in order to reduce the tax burden on dairy citizens. Our top priority is always students. But we have finite funds, our buildings are aging, we have been discussing the closing of a school for many years, we believe as an, uh, an SAU leadership team, that, that closing an elementary school and reorganizing students into six schools is the best option to realize savings without hurt, hurting educational opportunities of our students. Our process. We formed administrative subcommittees to investigate and research specific topics. These committees drew upon the work of earlier groups and were made up of district and school administrators. Additional teams will need to be formed to include all stakeholder groups as we develop action plans if, this, um, if the school board moves this forward. Those committees, as it says there, curriculum and instruction, logistics, staffing, research, transportation, extracurricular, and redistricting. So how is this possible? And I want everybody to hear this. In a perfect world, our preferred option is to keep all schools open make all necessary repairs, and upgrade all schools to 21st century modernized facilities. I said I wouldn't say anything about my preferred option was a new building, but we know that's gone by the wayside, at least for this year. Our charge asks us to reduce spending without negatively impacting student learning opportunities. We believe it is possible to close an elementary school and reduce spending all without increasing class sizes above current school board goals. And this would be accomplished by moving fifth grade students out of elementary schools and closing one of the elementary schools. Create three K through four elementary schools, one pre-K through four elementary school at Ernest, Ernest P. Barker, which means um, they would include the DEEP program, the Dairy Early Education program for um, three and four year olds. One five six intermediate school right here at West Running Brook and one seven eight middle school at Gilbert H. Hood. And close and sell the SAU moving the district administration over to the um, current deep space over at Gilbert H. Hood. I am now going to give the mic to Joseph. Thank you. Okay, so th this slide is being shared basically as a proof of concept. It's, um, uh, it is by no means a final draft. In fact, there are no school names here. Uh, this is just showing that we believe it is possible to close 
an elementary school, and we, we took a look at Davis demographic um, enrollment projections. We looked at October uh, October one enrollment, and then we also looked at real time uh, enrollment. And um, although you can find minor differences between those kind of three sets of data, the, the differences are pretty small, and uh, we believe this uh, kind of scenario works with all those numbers. Um, so just as Austin said, we believe it is possible to close one of the four older elementary schools, uh, but not obviously Ernest P. Barca as the largest school. Um, and then depending on whatever school is closed, we would then have to look at the assignment of classrooms and, and staffing. Um, and any decision to close an elementary school would require us to redistrict our elementary students uh, to ensure that we have balanced enrollment in the, in the remaining schools. Sorry, just having a little technical difficulty with my computer, but um, on this slide for savings that would be associated with our proposed plan, uh, by moving to this new plan, we'd have the opportunity to reduce personnel while realigning our staffing needs in order to better support students. Also, revenue from the possible sale of facilities could be used to repair or renovate remaining buildings. They would be in need to. Um, <coughs> sorry, too close. Um, they would be in need to um, duplicate the categorical programs to cover both schools. Um, this would provide students access to the general education classroom for integration and access to the general ed curriculum. Um, so, with this change, that would add two gap, two categorical programs to meet the needs of schools across students across all grade levels. Um, these additional programs will also provide more opportunity for additional students that would otherwise be placed out of district. Uh, with the closing of a school, um, there are some positions that may be consolidated. So as Austin said before, we, in order to, to kind of present this information to you, we, we convene several committees to really look at the effects on students, the effects on facilities, staffing, budget, all those things. Um, so uh, several committees really took a look at comparing the two possible models um, when you move fifth graders into the, into the kind of intermediate middle section. Do you do a five to six and a seven to eight school or a five through eight school? So uh, based on a, the kind of work in those committees, there are several reasons that we think that a five, six and a seven, eight Two, two different schools, a 5-6 school and a 7-8 school are uh, better. One is we believe it's uh, these two schools are developmentally more appropriate for younger adolescents, um, providing for a kind of a healthier transition from the elementary before they get to high school. Um, another benefit to that 5-6 and 7-8 model is it ensures that all students in the district will have common 5-8 through eight experiences uh, that would boost the true sort of community that can be created by having the entire town going to school together in these schools. Um, smaller fifth and sixth grade level teams provide uh, more flexibility than the, the current middle school model, uh, but more specialization than is in the current elementary model. Um, so for, ex for example, with smaller teams, more time could be devoted to math and literacy um, in grades five and six, which addresses a concern that we've we've highlighted through assessment data. Um, a five six school would also present opportunities for us to rethink um, flexible scheduling and more interdisciplinary instruction that just doesn't happen to happen to that extent in the current six through eight schools or the uh, K five schools. I think this next slide is me too. So some of the challenges that we that we looked at when um, when taking a look at the five through eight schools. So uh, 
we're not recommending that we create two five through eight schools, but we do feel it's necessary to talk a little bit about how, how, they're diff how a five, six, and a seven, eight school is different than two five through eight schools. So one of the big differences is that there are, there are developmental growth, maturity, intellectual, social differences um, between fifth and eighth graders that we think can be pretty vast. Um, in a lot of ways, we think sixth graders are much more closer developmentally to fifth graders than they necessarily are to seventh and eighth graders. Right now, we do put them all in the same school, but that's what, one of the reasons that we think a five, six school would be better for kids. Um, uh, in thinking about the different developmental needs, we recognize that there should be different instructional models that would meet the needs of those students. And having those different instructional models will create real challenges to scheduling and staffing um, if you ha try to do that all in one building. Um, we also believe there's a greater potential for inequity with having two five through eight schools, one of which would probably be bigger and the other one would be smaller. Um, and then there are spacing constraints and I think you guys are aware of this. Uh, with, a four per with four person teams, uh, they limit the amount of, um, uh, well, they, they take up a lot of space, and um, you either add a whole new team, which is four classrooms, or you reduce a, a team, uh, which is four classrooms, which make that model a little bit more challenging to work with space-wise. Um, so if we were to have two five through eight schools, both of those buildings need to be able to have four-person teams at four grade levels, and, and that's just more challenging in smaller buildings, for example, West Running Brook is quite a bit smaller than Gilbert H. of Middle School, so it would present much greater stressors on the space here if both schools had to kind of be identically structured. All right, I think this last one is, this one is for me one more time. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about some of these hurdles that we have to overcome. Obviously, the, you know, the first one is this idea that change is disruptive, change is hard, and that's something that we, we recognize. I don't think we want to um, diminish that or minimize the fact that anytime we're going to make a change, we recognize it's going to be challenging. Uh, we also believe, though, it provides opportunities for, for reimagining solutions. There are some great opportunities that would come from requiring, uh, requiring us to think about reorganizing our students. Um, we also think that change is, is a necessary part of improvement. Like You, you don't improve things without, without considering some changes. Um, we, we also t took a look at the rest of the state and many of our neighbors have five, six schools. And so although the idea of a five, six school to us is, is quite new in Derry, it's not, it's not a new idea in New Hampshire um, or even in Southern New Hampshire. Um, we also recognize that transitions are difficult for students. We do believe that we have supports in place to help students with these transitions. And we believe another benefit is, is that uh, these students will be transitioning together. So sometimes we think about that, and, and Austin will talk a little bit about this, but the, the impact of transitions on students, one of the big pieces is about changing peer groups, right? And so right now we have five elementary schools that then get combined into two middle schools and then that get combined into a big high school. Um, moving to a five, six, and then a seven, eight school, although we're introducing a sec another transition, all of those schools move to all of those students move together with the same peer group, which which really mitigates some of that transition. Not to say that it's not an issue. We recognize transitioning is hard. Um, we also think that there's an ability to intervene in schools um, to teach students uh, how to better cope with some of this change and some of the social challenges that come with uh, intermediate and middle school and then eventually high school. We think that parents can be a big part of this process, um, along with some of the other you know services or strategies that we already have in place to help with transitions. So with staffing, while teachers are appropriately licensed to teach in a 5-6 school, we will need to find within our staff the right teachers for each grade span. This will require the careful planning and input of teachers and administrators. However, together with our unions, we'll work closely to ensure that programming and staffing decisions are aligned with current collective bargaining agreements. Transitions. 
a great deal of research regarding what age is best for transitioning from elementary to middle is outdated and often different studies contradict with the findings of other research. Most recent studies focus on staff becoming aware of student concerns about the transition process and providing helpful interventions. Most of this information was brought out by um, Phil Baruti, former and now substitute counselor here at West Running Brook, and Tricia D. Girolamo, uh, still current um, counselor at Gilbert H. Hood Middle School, uh, back when this was first done, and um, we've added to that, but uh, their uh, help was instrumental on this, so thank you to them. Akos and Galassi, 2004, tell us that I shouldn't make my screen so small because then I can't see it. Sorry about that. <coughs> tell us that student concerns prior to middle school can be grouped into three areas. Academic, having more homework, more difficult classes. Procedural, finding their way around the school. And what um, Joe Crawford mentioned, social, making new friends, getting along with peers, fitting in. Estelle et al., 2007, indicated a positive aspect of transi transition is some students show patterns of improving adjustment during those middle school years, and therefore it has been suggested that this period would be views, viewed as a developmental opportunity. I don't know why it keeps doing that. When the schools can intervene to help youth who are struggling. Schwartz, Stifel, Rubenstein, and Zabel's 2011 study found that grades K through four to 5-8 span path, as well as the K through 8 schools led to more positive student achievement than other paths. Changing schools at an earlier grade, a smaller size of the within school cohort, and the stability of students' peer cohorts are the most likely explanations for these positive performance differences. And Galuski and Nunn, 2016, show that to prepare students for transition, it may be particularly important to focus intervention efforts on those children with low peer acceptance to increase their social support network. The strong links between peer acceptance and school adjustment suggest that school officials may positively impact students' school attitudes and achievement by introducing programs focused on improving those peer relationships. Social impact. Rick Wormley, 2011, an educational consultant and a former middle school teacher, wrote in an article for educational leadership and identified five mindsets for educators that he believes are key to designing successful transition programs. The five areas of focus he defines for a well-rounded program for students transitioning from elementary school include understanding students' concerns about belonging, empathizing with students, understanding the characteristics of the age group, focusing on the positive, and building hope. All of these research studies stress that the transition from elementary school to middle, no matter the age of the student or the grade level in which the transition occurs, can be a more positive experience for students. Implementation of a comprehensive transition program should include education, actual experiences in the new environment, and answers to student questions related to academics procedures, and especially social implications. Athletics and extracurricular activities. Article 10 bylaws stipulate that grades 5, 6, 7, and 8, caveat, if they are housed in the same building, may participate in competitive athletics. Grades seven and eight student enrollment numbers are used to determine division levels. 
currently there are districts that have a separate building for 5, 6, and 7, 8 that have a non-playoff season of games with opposing districts, B teams, for their 5th and 6th graders. All students in grades 5, 6, 7, and 8 can access intramural sports and all the extracurricular clubs. Based on numbers and competitive level, levels, our athletic directors will determine if there is a need to change the division level of competitive athletics. And based on historical student participation numbers, availability of qualified coaching candidates, student safety, and the regional trend in other districts, decisions will be made regarding what teams would be offered at each of the schools. Looking at redistricting in order to, for the um, plan to be feasible, the administration recommends using Davis demographics for redistricting where needed. Davis has prepared the most recent student enrollment and projection study, so they already have much of the information required to do the work on any boundary planning. Redistricting would also include any necessary resources from the town that Davis has worked closely with in the past for future developments, which may affect redistribution. As part of their work, we would develop a committee to provide direction and review recommendations. Depending on the number of meetings, the cost for redistricting um, and boundary planning could be anywhere between seven to 15,000, and that's depending on the number of meetings that you have. However, in talking to um, Lauren from Davis Demographics, who is um, the one that did the enrollment study in the past, um, the model that they've used before is that their initial meeting, they meet with administration to look at what the scope is going to be and um, enrollment and things like that. And then the following day, they would, um, we would meet with certain stakeholders, PTA members, also some members from the staff, for example, somebody f like Elizabeth Robido or George Sioris, also district staff, um, and the ideal group that they've worked with before is approximately 12 people to do that um, planning, and it lasts for about four to six hours. And during that planning session, um, you, we would be able to see all of the boundaries and the mapping of Derry with the seven schools and create scenarios during that four to six hour period and have multiple scenarios to be brought forward. Um, then we would share those uh, different scenarios that they would be posted online for at least a couple weeks and then they would be presented at a school board to allow um, public input for those um, recommendations. In order to provide the widest coverage of transportation with the available buses, grades five through eight would ride buses together. Surrounding towns, oh, Wyndham, Cliff, Hampstead. sorry, I didn't mean to interject, but I think you guys skipped a slide. That was one that's out of order because oh. we, next steps is one of the last things we want to talk oh, about. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, surrounding towns, Windham, Hampstead, and Chester also do this. Uh, school arrival and dismissal times would be staggered between the two intermediate buildings to allow travel time between the schools. All grades, five, six, seven, and eight students from both West Running Brook and Gilbert H. Hood will ride buses together based on residence. Buses will drop off seventh and eighth graded students at Gilbert Hood, then transport the fifth and sixth grade students to West Running Brook. Buses would pick up the 7th and 8th grade students at Gilbert Hood first in the afternoon, then move to West Running Brook to pick up the 5th and 6th graders. Every effort will be made to provide athletic transportation. And ridership studies have shown that the buses wouldn't be overcrowded due to the changes in these routes. Since the original study back in May of 2018 regarding technology, which was a huge component in that study, uh, the district has made substantial progress in providing technology access for students and staff, including providing devices for each student, upgraded internet, and multiple software adoptions. We do not see any further improvements to be necessary to make the change in this school configuration. Now is the slide that we missed. 
So uh, next steps, we've mentioned this before, timing, approximately 18 months of preparation is needed. Um, uh, enrollment, uh, our, uh, our I apologize, time. Our expectation is that this would be an 18-month process because any new model would require substantial changes to curriculum, schedules, budgeting, staffing, transportation, et cetera. Redistricting, um, Jane mentioned the, a little bit more of the specifics, but um, issues with enrollment would take time as well. Staffing. Administration would work closely with the two unions, teachers, and other staff to make appropriate decisions on staffing. Curriculum, the instructional program should be tailored to meet the needs of the students. Efforts should be made to design programming that takes advantage of the specific organization of each school. Curriculum committees composed of teachers and admin would need to develop and communicate a clearly defined curriculum and instructional vision for each grade span. Athletics and extracurricular clubs and activities, decisions will be made regarding the participation of younger students in middle school sports. The program for acceleration and curriculum enhancement, otherwise known as PACE, decisions will need to be made regarding what extent the PACE program is often at different grade levels. Categorical programs, Laura mentioned this earlier, program approval will be sought for providing categorical programming at all levels. Professional development, staff members would need time and training in order to adapt to new instructional models mostly needed at the 5-6 level. And transportation, as Dr. Dancy just mentioned, there would be some changes to uh, costs or access of transportation, but time would be needed to, there would be, I apologize, there would not be substantial changes to costs or access to transportation, but time would be needed to develop appropriate solutions. And that is our presentation, and now we are open for comments, questions, etc. I have a question about special ed. Um, I know that one of the stumbling blocks with the original facilities committee was having both the categorical programs at both middle schools. Would having those at both middle schools help the current out of district students who we don't have places for right now in some of the programs? It could, um, depending on who's ready to come back to the district, um, having the two classrooms with smaller numbers, um, you know, the five, six, and the seven, eight, would, would definitely allow for some more space um, and some more consideration without students coming back to a larger group. Um, so that certainly is something I, I would look forward to. An another question on the five, six, seven, eight, uh, curriculum-wise, are we looking at the middle school model for UAs, similar to what is in middle school right now? So I, you know, we're not a hundred percent sure. Um, the 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 we've we've experimented or talked with a bunch of different schools that do a bunch of different things. Um, I would say if if we had to, that first off, I think that decision should be made with teachers. Um, and because of the nature of the need to, to make this presentation for you all, we didn't pull any teachers out of their classrooms and have them sit through these meetings to plan it. They should be part of that decision. Uh, a lot of the conversations we've had as an admin group have been about there needs to be some hybrid, some middle ground between, um, you know, the big, big difference between elementary and middle, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, elementary and middle school UA is that elementary students go to one UA day and they typically go once, once a week and it kind of rotates, whereas middle school students go to the same two UAs for an entire term usually, or semester, uh, or sorry, trimester. Um, and they, they're in UAs somewhere closer to 90 minutes a day, whereas elementary school students, it's closer to 45 minutes a day. Um, there's pros and cons to those. Uh, if we are looking to target additional math and literacy instruction at the fifth and sixth grade level, my guess is that we would want uh, more time in classrooms doing that work and maybe less time off at UAs and specials. But I think that's a there's a nuanced answer to that question, which is you really have to get teachers involved because perhaps 
AUA is a STEM class that is science and math related. So I don't want to paint with too broad a brush and say that like you can only do math in core classes and not in UA classes because that's not really true. But I'm trying to answer your question without being too specific because the truth it's is actually teachers actually pretty much what I was looking for. I think that okay. there is an opportunity to do that to make a hybrid model. To do, yeah. I think that that's one of the excellent opportunities of a five six model. Um, and I'm hoping something that we lack right now in sixth grade is something that you guys will look look for in fifth grade is if you do have a separate UA, we talk about the social and academic transition into middle school. I would love to see cut back the intro to middle school UA, where it goes over executive function, where it goes over social peer interaction, pe positive peer interaction, something that you know we kind of go over and focus right now, but isn't an entire class based on study habits, how to study. I think that um, a lot of middle school students I don't have a lot of time to learn how to study coming from elementary school, so something like that going into the UA. Um, and on that note of transition, one of the things that did come out of the 2017 um, report was the creation of a transition team, and not just for students within, like coming into UA, but for the entire community and for parents and everything else. And I highly suggest that you guys take that opportunity to create a transition team um, that consists of admin, parents, teachers, educa educators, um, and specifically special ed teachers and paras to make sure that we're not losing that most vulnerable part because transitions to those students, I think, are gonna be the most difficult. So I had a related question, actually, because one of the things that was brought up in 2017 and that has been brought up before is which model do you use in 5-6? Do you use an elementary model? Do you use a middle model? Or do you use a more for the two? I did some of my own research, and I found towns that used an elementary model, towns that used a middle model. Do you Are you leaning either way, or is that something you still are looking to determine? Yeah, I mean, it is uh, the devil's in the details. Um, I think there isn't one elementary model and there isn't one middle school model. I think uh, in some of our elementary schools currently, you see students, uh, or in the past, I think it still actually happens currently, but I want to be careful here, that uh, they have shared teachers, uh, teachers have shared students where one teacher may focus on humanities and one may focus on math and science. So that's a bit of a hybrid model. I think that in our conversations as an admin group, we uh, were very excited about uh, an instructional model that wouldn't be completely siloed or or um, sort of chained to just one way of teaching. Um, so, uh, you know, I think sometimes people think about elementary school as just a single classroom instruction and middle school is just, you know, every 45 minutes a bell rings and you go to a different room. Um, I think we envision it being somewhere in between those two. Um, but, I, but I think we want to get some teachers involved to talk about, um, you know, perhaps teams, but maybe they're teams of two or three teachers. Um, and, you know, maybe we don't always think about math and science as distinctly separate different subjects, which is how we often view them at the middle school level, but maybe um, you know, sort of instructionally that doesn't always hold weight. Um, so I hate to keep saying it, there's a little bit of uh, uh, nuance here and that we do need to sit with teachers, but we've explored this, and I think hybrid is probably the safest answer that we think there's room for that. I got to admit with the pandemic, I have a little PTSD when it comes to that word hybrid. So um, I think that's why they actually focused on, and there's, there's at least one other district, I think that calls it an intermediate. Um, the thought process wa would be that it's not an elementary school and it's not a middle school. It's somewhere in that intermediate stage. And I, I understand where Mr. Crawford is coming with that H word, but um, you know, <laughs> maybe we'll stick with high, uh, intermediate for a while. Well, you said to uh, make a list, so um, hold on to your hat. Um, and I only have four things, um, two of which are questions and two of which are some comments. Um, with respect to questions, when you mentioned an 18 month uh, period of transition, would that be, um, I'm assuming that would be, and in, 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 uh, that would be from the starting point of a new school year. 
it wouldn't be just an arbitrary date. Let's do it next month and then 18 months from there. Um, well, you know, people ask strange questions. So I wanted to make that clear that that would be um, the beginning or the, you know, the, the starting line would be the beginning of a school year and then 18 months from there. Um, the second question was about the, uh, the SOU. Um, the SOU has been added on to uh, cobble together. Um, I think you have everything except a tent out there. You might have that. Um, but is there the square footage available in what's now the deep area? Is that adequate or comparable to the square footage that you had or you have now um, in the current SOU, including all of the area that you use? Uh, I'm going to, uh, is, oh, <laughs> there's Jeremy. Hi, <laughs> hi, Jeremy. I'm looking down the end. Um, I, I forget the name of the gentleman, but uh, Jeremy and I went over to Deep. Um, they invited me over there when, and I'm going to turn this back over him, when we looked at the space and talked about um, how we believe it might be able to be reconfigured. Yeah, I don't know the exact number. For square footage um, we didn't look into that but we walked the space and we kind of pointed out you know without putting too much effort into it at this time you know we kind of said this would work here and that sort of thing so I mean we kind of talked about it but it didn't go much further than that until I know there was some conversation about uh, at one time um, optimizing the uh, available space by um, having an SOU we'll say uh, just for purposes of illustration in the deep area and then having um, other individuals that were involved in administration in other available areas. Um, and uh, I understand that's a, making good use of space, but that's the uh, advantage. The disadvantage is we all know that a lot of informal communication gets achieved, things get achieved through informal communication when people just are in the presence of each other. So that being said, the two well, let me jump in, Paul. Um, yeah. I, I believe it's one of the things that we tried to do with the reconfiguring of the space that where we are now, all of finances together, special ed, um, curriculum, and so forth. Um, we believe uh, with the classrooms, uh, yes, there'd need to be some money spent because you'd have to build walls and, and so forth, but the thought process of a classroom where all of finance would then be in that one classroom just like they are down in the back corner of uh, the portable part of the SAU now um, with the idea of an office in there and some conference area and, and all the rest of the stuff that goes along with it with maybe uh, cubicles depending on how much privacy people need and, and so forth and so on. So uh, the thought process would be that groupings and we do believe, after looking at that space with some modifications, we could get the SAU staff uh, in there. And the one thing we did stress is there would be a need for that. The original, and well, I don't know if it was the original, right? But <laughs> when I was there, the entranceway, which is up the stairs and uh, and straight in where. Um, um, 71 door one thank you <laughs> door one um, we would need to section that off and that would be an entrance way so that people could use the, the uh, wheelchair area coming up the ramp and coming around and coming in there and then we would have to have um, some handoff because you would still have to cut through the hallway to get into where the deep area is now but that's you know getting ahead of ourselves, but that's some of the things okay. we looked at. Okay. Um, one of the remaining two things that um, um, you mentioned were, were the um, executive functioning skills. Um, I remember, and I'm sure that both Austin and um, Joe remember, that in the middle school when we had a, uh, one of the uh, core subjects was um, study skills. And um, it worked very well. It was a very, very comprehensive 
um, curriculum where students learned um, organizational skills, they learned uh, library skills, um, research, all types of things, and uh, it, I think it, uh, the, the results bore out very well. Um, I don't know if that was cut, it was cut during my tenure here, um, but I don't know if that was cut um, as a cost-saving measure or when we experienced that huge bubble of uh, population in, um, uh, what, maybe what, 12, 15 years ago? I don't know, but um, we at that time realized that, that was, uh, there was a need for that, and I think that uh, it's an astute observation that, that uh, we should be returning, at least if not in that model, to something like that again. Um, and the earlier we do it, um, for instance, at the five grade, at the grade five level, um, I think that the uh, that foundation is laid earlier. It uh, it yields uh, it yields fruit, so to speak, um, much much uh, earlier, and uh, it's much more productive in the long run. The last thing is um, a few maybe two weeks ago. Um, I spent a morning at. Uh, um, at Derry Village with um, Angela Baba and um, went over, uh, she explained to me everything that they're doing in terms of the uh, science curriculum that they, are trying, that they are introducing and working with right now in the lower grades. And uh, she was uh, very, very um, excited about the opportunities that would be presented um, if we had a five, six model, and they could have a permanent core science curriculum within that fifth grade. Um, I speak about this constantly. Um, I can't, I can't uh, emphasize the fact that uh, science, technology, um, those things are uh, certainly going to put students on the cutting edge to succeed in the future. I know it's not the do all and end all, but. Um, it is a fact that uh, most of the things that in manufacturing and research are all predicated um, with uh, science and math are involved. So um, I think that that is one of the things that we really can't overlook at all. We have to understand that um, students coming into that fifth grade would now be introduced to a science curriculum um, that would be concrete that would be a p part of a curriculum that would be a multi-year curriculum, um, not just some things that were interesting and useful but cobbled together. Um, and I think that um, based upon what, what she told me and the things she showed me and went over, um, the students were um, very, very interested and involved. And the teachers were um, ex the teachers that were involved with this uh, pilot program, if you want to call it that, were uh, really on board with it, uh, very very much. So I think that you can't get in a better situation than that. And I think that with this uh, this type of a model, um, uh, I think that there's no uh, there's no really downside when it comes to the curriculum. So, and at that, I will be quiet. Okay, just want to add to that. Um Joseph, correct me if I'm wrong, was it Kim Conant that talked to Angela? Um, uh, has already talked to Angela as well and let her know that we want her involved in that planning and she has agreed um, to be part of that. <laughs> so DEEP is just about 7,000 and the SAU is just about 8,000 square feet. I would suggest that some of that 8,000 is not great space. <laughs> so it's probably pretty close, and maybe the 7,000 is actually more usable space than the actual 8,000 that we have. So I think we'll be fine. So I also have a couple of questions. I actually have more, but I'm not going to go back and look for them. Um, so the comment was made about clearly defined curriculum. Why don't we have that now? Um, I'll just ask my, all my questions because they kind of blend together. Um, why don't we have science or a more comprehensive science program in our elementary schools? I know I've asked that before. I don't know where it went and why we don't have it. But we should have it. Um, 
do we have a current um, an, new uh, market analysis on the SAU? And what does 21st century learning mean? Since um, I know that my son was in fifth grade and we had a giant celebration for 21st century learning with the Commissioner of Education, the National Commissioner of Education at the time was Lamar, Le Lamar Alexander. George Bush called Dave Brown on the phone and we talked about 21st century learning and what Derry was doing then. So what happened? So I'll take, I can take the two curriculum questions if that's all right. So, um, so I, I, I think your question was why don't we have a clearly defined curriculum? And I, I never said we didn't have a clearly defined curriculum, but I do believe that uh, five, six, we should design the curriculum to meet the needs of that specific developmental age group. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, I'll, uh, we can come back if, if that doesn't make sense. So, and what I mean by that is um, we can, we should tailor curriculum so that it, it absolutely targets the students where they're at right now. Um, like one way to think about it is, um, uh, you know, Sir, Sir Cam Robinson was a great, great um, speaker about education. He talked about this idea that um, a three-year-old is not half a six-year-old um, and that, that we need to teach the children for who they are right now. Um, it's actually a big, big uh, set philosophical sort of underpinning of middle school philosophy is the idea that you aren't teaching future Pinkerton kids, you're teaching current middle school kids. And so my point about, uh, and I don't know if it was specifically that point, is that um, the curriculum should absolutely match and be designed to meet the developmental needs of those kids. I, I do think we have a uh, clearly defined curriculum. I think it's m better defined today than it was five years ago. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the, the work that the teachers have done around competencies and, and I can statements, which is like, but it's never a complete process. I think the curriculum would be better next year than it is right now, and that's simply just sort of the iterative process of curriculum development. Um, I also, I don't believe that I ever said there's no science right now in elementary school. I do think science happens in elementary school. I think um, one of the challenges of K to five schools though is there are, um, uh, those teachers are teaching all subjects and it can be, and sometimes science is uh, shortchanged. I don't know that, I don't think that I'm telling anybody something that you don't know. I think that our teachers at the elementary school are heavily focused on math and literacy, and that's a great thing, we want that, uh, but it's one of those zero sum games that you have a certain number of minutes in the day, and they only have a certain amount of, of instructional capacity and expertise, and it can be really hard to be, uh, to be experts on everything. Um, I, th I think if I was in, um, I was at Barca today, and I will tell you that they, there are a lot of experts there, and they are, they are experts at a lot of things. Um, if we move to a five-six model, I think what we could do with is have the ability to do more teaming, where you may be able to have members of the team that become STEM experts that that heavily focus on math and science instruction. Um, that that doesn't happen and can't really happen to the extent that that it might at a five-six school in the K to five model. And I don't think it's because of lack of ability or lack of effort. I think it has to do with the structure and the lack of time that they have. Um, so I, 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 if, I, if I implied that there's no science happening in middle school, I'm sorry, that's not true. There's definitely science happening. There's more science happening now than there probably were, was in the past because of Angela Barber and the great work that she's done along with you know Kim and all the curriculum people. So those are the two curriculum questions. I have no idea about the market analysis, so I'm gonna look for somebody else to answer that one and the 21st century learning, I think you mentioned that. So um, I'm gonna say no. Uh, I do not believe we've done any type of market analysis on the SAU unless possibly it was done back in 17 or something during that process. I do believe that is something along with, um, you know, I use that little example of um, a, an X-ray, an ultrasound, and an MRI. When we finally get somebody, whether it be Gale Associates or one of their competitors who wins the RFP, um, then we'll get a deeper understanding of those three buildings. I think also we need to, you know, we know there's been some talk with the town about the community center and, and how that might 
work out. I think we have to have more discussions around there. And it, you know, when we first put this out two weeks ago, when we were first going to have our facilities workshop, there were some questions as to why we didn't pick a school. And you know, we had the school board had to pick a school back in April because we were going to a. Um, what do you call it, the school building aid application. And it required us to pick some because they had to come out and they had to look at the schools and all that. I don't think we should do that now. If the school board does not want to move forward with this, okay, then it's scrapped and we don't move forward. If they want to move forward, we need to uh, get a company to do this deeper dive into the um, those buildings. We need to talk to the town about the community center and are they interested in any of our buildings for that and I would agree with you that we probably have to do some market analysis to say if we're going to get out of this as my, my understanding is nobody wants the back section the portable it's been there forever but you know we've seen with a place like Grinnell one of the oldest buildings we have and its bones and so forth are in great shape I would guess that in 1901, they built things pretty strong too. So, um, you know, I would agree. We, we need to do a market analysis on that and we need to do those all, all those other things. And we're getting there. It's, it's just so much information to get and it does take time. And, um, um, you know, so I would say that's definitely stuff that needs to happen as well. So I have another curriculum question. We our, our fifth graders and sixth graders, when they were in the elementary schools, used to change classes for science and math, social studies. We could go back to that as well, right? So that you have people who are, um, I don't want to say expert, but people who are more skilled and more interested in certain subjects than in others. So you're going to somebody who loves science and STEM, and you're going to somebody who loves LA, and you have a different um, educational model that's right. how we used to what we used to do and it seemed to work I, I don't know why we stopped it honestly I think maybe just because of numbers yeah and I think uh, that's what Kathy alluded to with this idea of looking at that um, some people um, are better at a certain it, they love the subject it's just one of their you know so um, that's what happened there uh, when we did that, and I think we need to look at that for the um, five six model. When we, um, from a from a certification standpoint, according to what Kathy's seen, for the most part, it seems like we have many, you know there are some seven through twelve specific subject areas, but we don't have a a, a ton of those individuals. A lot of them are um, five through twelve or uh, K through eight and so forth. But yes, it would be looking at interest. Um, you know, usually we put these things out as a, um, a volunteer, who wants to volunteer. And then depending on that, we will look at it and um, see who we think fits, fits best within that. But it will definitely be a process that will take some time. But you're right. We have people that have done that already in the past. And I was implying that we keep I was implying that we keep K at five and oh, switch okay. in K to five, but that's right. okay. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Um, have, you f have you received any feedback from teachers, principals? I, I assume you mentioned committees in the beginning. Were they part of the committee? And what, what was their thoughts on this um, discussion? So we, we have not um, engaged a great deal with teachers on this because we just haven't had the time to pull them out in focus groups. And that would be the next step if the board decides, um, you know, we, we want to move forward, then we do need to form committees. But right now, we, we didn't feel like we could pull them out of classrooms to do that. Um, uh, we got a lot of feedback from the administrative team because we, we get to pull them all the time. And so... Uh, for instance, I, I worked on the curriculum um, committee that had uh, middle school and elementary school admin. All Everybody in that room has taught in one or both of those grade levels. Um, and some of the people have worked in, um, specifically in fifth and sixth grade, 
Um, so, th so we got a lot of input from people, um, but right now we haven't we haven't pulled teachers out of classrooms yet to talk about it. Let me just go back to sort of what Brenda said. I know, Brenda, you were talking about keeping the K-5, which is definitely still a possibility. Another possibility is if a school, for whatever reason, it's determined that when you still can go through forward with this vote with a 5-6 and a 7-8 and a K-4 and keep the schools open <laughs> because basically you're just moving now. That would be a lot of work, and some people would say, why? Um, uh, but you're basically moving the space that's now at the middle school, then the space would be at the elementary schools. But when you say why, I've seen um, a great deal of excitement from our curriculum people especially, um, having this thought process of being able to rethink, okay, we're going to have this immediate school, intermediate school now, rethinking what we could do. You know, you've got these older elementary school kids, you know, and younger middle school kids, and you're putting them together and what we could do, and there's been some great conversations just between them. And I do believe that if, when we get the teachers involved, we'll get some of that enthusiasm from the teachers as well, who would be, some of them will be ecstatic to be in seventh and eighth grade because little kids scare them. You know? um, other ones will be like, I would love to be in a five, six school. I think that's perfect. So, you know, there's some excitement in, in, in the SAU and throughout um, some of the administration about the possibilities that we could do, <laughs> whether a school gets closed or not, just to be able to really rethink things and um, do some things differently, especially um, for those fifth and sixth graders. Funny you should mention, funny you should mention that because um, as you were saying that, or just before you were saying that, I was making some notes on numbers here and uh, this is not well thought out, but you won't be able to tell from the things that are well thought out from me, so that they're pretty much the same. Um, but if we were to, if we were to go to the five, six, seven, eight model, and um, all of the fifth graders were uh, consolidated within that fifth grade um, intermediate or uh, lower middle school or whatever we want to term it at the time, um, sell, raise, whatever the yes, the uh, SOU, uh, the uh, SAU, um, and then what about moving the administration into Grinnell and keeping all the schools open? If that's something that is important and if it's cost effective, it certainly isn't going to be cheap. But if that's what um, if that's what uh, might be an option, um, would we have? I mean, I. It would seem that we would have enough room to be able to, to do that and probably give the administration more room in a building that would be a standalone or a half standalone building. That's, like I said, not well thought out, just off the top of my head. And the answer is not well thought out from here, other than <laughs> we have the space, we're saying we have the space to move fifth grade out of the elementary schools and close a school. So we would absolutely have the space if we didn't close a school. Cliff, I just wanted to double check. So I know that on the transportation side, it's that you said a, a lot wouldn't change. I'm what, did you, do you know time-wise if it would change things? because obviously you're putting one extra grade of kids on those buses. That's correct. However, we get also get to consolidate some runs too. As you know, we have two buses that run out Hampstead Road and one picks up on the north side and one picks up on the south side to go to Gilbert Hood and to go to, we have that at Kendall Pond Road. We've got that. There's at least three or four routes that are serviced by two buses. In fact, I had one situation earlier this year where 
a West Running Brook bus was closer to the house than the Gilbert Hood bus, and the kids had to walk almost a mile to get to the Gilbert Hood stop, and I couldn't put them on the West Running Brook. This would alleviate a lot of that, so we're going to be able to consolidate, and by putting 5th through 8th on the same bus, we don't have to double up the buses. If we didn't, we'd have to have a whole set of buses do the whole town twice, and so it's going to work. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to ask. Uh, question, I think the term you used was balanced enrollment across the district. So um, I often, you know, we look at these monthly enrollment reports. Also, we, sometimes we get the specific school enrollment reports, and they're kind of all over the place. Um, if going forward, um, no school was closed, um, would we have to look at a redistricting in the next few years anyway? You're, uh, uh, I apologize. Let me just clarification. You're saying move fifth grade to mid to. No, up. If, if we did oh. nothing, I'll, I'll give it a shot. That is cool. I mean, the short answer is that's a that's a math problem that I don't know that I've run or anybody here has okay. run. Um, but I will. So to speak to that, um, some of the balancing problems that we experience in the district is related to having five schools, um, and. Um, you know, going down to four schools is reducing your number of schools by 20%, right? Um, and what you end up, and by removing fifth grade, what you do is you create a lot more first grade classrooms in each school. Well, not a, you create more first grade classrooms, more second grade classrooms, more third grade classrooms in each school, which allows for when you do have those bubbles to spread them more evenly through classrooms. So right now when we have, you know, five first graders move into um, one school, uh, and that school only has three first grade classrooms, it's just really challenging. So the, the consolidation does help with some of that, right? Uh, but your question is a little bit more complicated. If we did nothing, <laughs> would we need to redistrict sometime? In, in keeping in mind, too, the Davis Demographics report that shows pretty big drop-offs in East Area and increases in center of town. So. Yeah, so it might be necessary, whether that is necessary in five years, 10 years. I don't, I don't have the answer okay. to that. Jane or somebody else might. But Food I for thought. Yeah, and one of the other things would be, one of the um, uh, pushes uh, definitely seems to be to move deep um, to an elementary school seems to be something that a majority of the school board is interested in. So that alone, because you're talking uh, minimum uh, five classrooms and and the um, related service space and so forth and so on like we we thought of um, Ernest P Barker because it was the biggest and had the most space and the thought process would be that the kindergarten wing that's sort of separate would become the deep wing and um, it would you know potentially you'd need to redistrict if you did that because you're not going to be able to fit the 500 and something kids and, and so forth. So depending on on what you do and depending on looking at the future, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think Joe's right. That would be something we would need to look at. Uh, the thought process off the top of my head is if you uh, don't move fifth grade, if you don't close a school, and we are status quo, then we will probably stay status quo for a period of time and work to fix up the buildings. You know, hopefully get those um, capital reserve funds to get those things going no matter what happens um, and go from there. Okay. Uh, Jane, on your estimated savings, um, in the 2017 we had kind of a very rough chart with where the savings were coming from is it possible to put that to recreate that and put the new numbers in I imagine this is basically the same thing it's just inflation has pushed that up now to 50, to 1.5 to 2 it was a little under 1 million before um, but there may be other things now that we've kind of changed that model to um, I don't need it tonight but just at some point yes that can be done all right thank you Sorry, I don't want to anyway stop questions, but what I would ask is that if people can think of specific questions they'd like asked and answered before the 14th when we'll discuss this again in public and 
and that would give the administration time to answer any questions people may have when we have the discussion in public that would be also good to either raise tonight or if you don't think of it tonight before the next meeting that was just a reminder not a did you guys look at what the year one implementation costs would be any chance at this point or no So I don't think we have any hard costs on year one implementation because there are so many moving pieces that haven't been decided yet. Um, we know that there will be immediate savings and then recurring savings. Uh, uh, but there are some costs associated with, for instance, I don't know if this is what you're referring to, but doing the market analysis on the SAU, paying whatever fees and, and everything we need to do to have our proper, if, if we decide to sell a building, we there are some costs associated with that. Assuming that the sale goes through, you recoup a lot of those costs, but, um, uh, and then the other hard cost that I think Jane talked about was the Davis demographics. There's, it's a pretty small cost when you think about the overall s uh, scope of it. Um, but uh, if there are specific hard costs that you think we haven't uh, talked about, we can, okay. Awesome. And I'm, I'm assuming there would have to be some sort of estimate for reconfiguring the deep for the administrative offices as well. Yeah, and I'm bound and determined to get the STEM thing uh, out on the table again and keep talking about that. You know, um, uh, there's going to be savings, um, but like you folks do with, with some of the monies, you keep some of it back to put it in reserve and, you know, the thought process of developing a, um, a unified arts STEM um, in the elementary schools um, uh, is, is with um, STEM teachers is something, you know, so um, when we look at um, savings, there'll be in a, uh, there'll be much more savings than we will be, but we would, I'm warning you, <laughs> we're probably going to want to put some of those things forward to the board to talk about it and say, what do you think of this? Um, we'd like to potentially move in this direction, and there would be a little bit of a cost because you might be moving from an assistant to a, to a teacher, for instance. Can I ask a follow-up timeline question that may be something to explain at the, at the February 14th meeting when we have a further discussion? But... Would the 18-month timeline start roughly now, meaning that in 18 months you could transition, meaning the fall of 2024, or would you really be looking at the fall of 2025 in a hypothetical scenario? So we do believe um, uh, if the um, uh, school board votes to move uh, the fifth grade, we're going to want to start get going immediately. Now we're going to have... Um, three new positions on the school board and it all could change in a month and we are aware of that but we're not going to wait the month we're going to at least start talking to uh, uh, the committees and start reaching out to teachers and those kind of things and if it ends up getting voted and then a new board comes in and they decide not to go that route okay we've started it with no harm no foul but the thought process would be we would get going right away so that 24, uh, the 24, the, what is it, fiscal year 25, 24, 25, um, we'd be ready to go, um, is the thought process. Uh, so question I have, uh, well, I've got many questions. Um, so, <clears throat> The uh, the enrollments, if we were to change to this configuration, how confident are we that we would be within our classroom goals that we had prior to the most recent vote that we had? So we have the space to stay within our classroom goals. Um, so very confident. Perfect. Um, another question I have is if we were to move to this configuration where we did close an elementary school um, and so we had K through four, if at any time in the future we, we were to build a new school, um, is it, a, I assume this, but I didn't want to assume, um, would the 
continued kind of new normal be a K through four model. And then if we were to build a new elementary school, we would only need a K through four elementary school at that time as well. I would say we could do that unless, you know, the school board at the time decides maybe they want to do a, uh, uh, you know, primary early. Uh, but yeah, um, um, it, everything could be looked at. It, it wouldn't make sense if you went K-4 to, to do something like a, have one school that would be K-5 or something. So, uh, but it could be K-4 or it could be, uh, you know, uh, an older elementary, a younger elementary, or whatever the school board is interested in, or the town. Perfect. Yeah, I know when we had talked with um, lovely Brent Singer that having five grades was a little bit more costly because we had to have a third floor, so um, just future needs that would be hopefully less expensive to build a smaller school. Um, with the special education, um, so when we talk about all categorical categorical programs needing to be present at both five, six, and seven, eight. Um, does this require more, less, or the same resources than what we have today? That would require a teacher at each of the programs as well as assistance to support. Um, the assistance wouldn't necessarily be an additional cost. It would just be uh, moving over to another school, but there would be a cost of a teacher for each of the programs. Thank you. And then um, when we say potential to increase student population in categorical programs, so I, I, th I think this was kind of asked, um, but would we say that see that as an overall positive where we could potentially bring students back in and or would it give us an opportunity to potentially be an out of district placement for um, other surrounding areas where um, we could service them as well? I would say both. Um, for students that are ready to come back to um, the district and be housed within the program, it would certainly open up spaces for them. Um, I do get regular phone calls from other districts asking about, um, com you know, what our availability is for programming, which would allow for some revenue as well. And follow up to that, is that a source of revenue for the town uh, or for the district in that case, if we were to take out of district placement students from other districts? Yes, yep, we would collect tuition for them. And that would be in the IELTS program, in the Project Me program, um, NECC is, continues to be capped out. Um, moving on to the rationale for 5678 model. Uh, so we talked about it's more developmentally, developmentally appropriate. Um, I'm going to kind of put on my sales hat here, and so that's great to hear, but what kind of proof points do we have? I know we uh, provided studies for um, other parts of the presentation, so I guess what proof points do we have for that? You say w what kind of what points? Like proof. Proof points, okay. yeah, research, yeah. Um, so I don't, uh, we did not put together any like um, uh, research. Well, there is research out there about uh, the developmental needs. We didn't We didn't tie any of that to this. So what we did is we, we talked as an admin team and we just kind of went with our experiential knowledge. Um, uh, we did reach out and we talked with other five, six schools like in Bedford and Wyndham and we got some feedback from what they have seen experientially, uh, but we didn't we didn't cite any um, sort of like peer reviewed studies or anything. Uh, the the mindset behind it though is that, um, and some of this comes with you know I, I did 13 years at the middle school level. Um, some of it comes with the the really difficult transition that happens when kids move from fifth to sixth grade. Um, the entire environment and structure of middle school is almost alien to what you see in an elementary school. I've, I've, I've seen it now that I'm touring schools. Um, and for many, many of our students, especially students that are on this sort of, I'm gonna say less mature continuum, side of the continuum, um, it, is, uh, it is like pushing someone into the deep end of the swimming pool before they're a little bit ready. And, um, and, and, and it happens across, you know, their kids adapt. Uh, kids are resilient and teachers are unbelievable sixth grade staff what they do to get kids ready there's just a there's a lost period of time as kids are really adapting um, because they are just intellectually and socially maybe not ready for uh, carrying a, a binder and going to six different classes and and, and tracking all that um, we could pull together some some sort of empirical studies we've just been basing it on sort of observations and experience Thank you. And then 
Um, we talk about uh, uh, equitable for all, so I know that's really important, equity, um, so everyone's kind of on an even playing field. Is that based off of um, kind of the classroom sizes? And like I know currently we look at some, some elementary schools or middle schools where, you know, you have um, – a first grade where you have 18 students at one school and then you have first grade students where the classroom sizes are like 22 or 23 um, and again that may that may not be 100 percent accurate but we see those kind of disparities do we are uh, kind of in line with Derek's point if we're flat f flattening the enrollment is, is that where the equity we're seeing so that I think that's a great example of equity, and, and I almost think of that as a great example of, example of our ability to balance out class sizes. But specifically in the, in the um, presentation, what I was speaking about was um, the, it, is, it is really hard to control for equity when you have um, a percentage of your students go to one school for middle school and a percentage of your students go to another school for middle school and those two schools are different sizes with different access to resources. Um, I think they've, we've done a great job at trying to make the West Running, exper West Running Brook experience and the uh, Gilbert H. Uh, Middle School experience comparable and I would say very, very similar. Uh, but my point was is if you have all fifth and sixth graders in one building and all seventh and eighth, they are gonna get an equitable experience um, that, that is really, I would say, nearly impossible to create. It's, it's an ideal, and everybody wants to believe that every single school is identical to the other, but that, I mean, I don't even know that that's realistic. Most people recognize that. So that's what I was getting at in terms of the equality piece or equity. Could you, for our next discussion on the 14th, um, pull together just a couple of those studies on the developmentally that show that, and also, maybe come up with a list of the other schools in New Hampshire that use this model and whether whether it's whether they use it as a upper elementary and middle school or as middle and middle I don't know if any use it that way the ones I know do but kind of show to kind of show where else it's done thank you uh, yeah I mean I have more but uh, other people are willing Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, next one, I guess, uh, the hurdles overcome. So uh, we talk about change is disruptive. Um, going back to Austin's point where, you know, in an ideal world, um, you know, there may be two other options that we would like to kind of um, possibly go after. So to that, um, if we were to keep all five elementary schools and keep kind of the status quo, um, where we're thinking about modernizing our schools or bringing them up to a 21st century standard, um, would you also say that that would also – require similar change or similar um, I guess potential disruptions uh, during throughout the day where if we were to do these types of big uh, overhauls of our current facilities that you know kids may be displaced or kids may be put in portables or there would be shifting of schools yeah the the first thought is of course money you know, we got to fix the roofs. That's not going to change anything as far as the um, makeup of the schools and flexible spacing. And I, um, we have so much to do to repair and fix up our schools that that seems to be the uh, the number one priority when it comes to the monies being spent there. We don't want leaks anymore. And we want to fix those kind of things. So I I, I do believe that. Um, bringing them up as we speculated with the new building and so forth would take a number of years longer uh, because again there's only so much money that we can put forward you know um, mr. Crawford and uh, worked um, over a couple of days uh, uh, with um, I forget the gentleman name's name from net zero J something but it, uh, Jeff Moulton apologize Jeff thank you thank you Jeff for the assistance with that but Joe spent a couple of days locked in his uh, in his office and um, you know examples of um, fixing up the roofs and getting maybe getting solar along with that um, doesn't necessarily do anything to the inside other than a possibly a better environment and maybe 
um, helping, you know, we spend some money and we save some money because of sort of like we did with Honeywell, um, save some money over time. So, it, But the problem would be that it will take some time to get to that point. But first and foremost, we fix up the schools, then we can look at maybe, you know, spending some money to uh, take down some walls and open up some flexible spacing. But that would be probably beyond my time, I would guess. <laughs> Thank you. And then just one last question, I promise. Um, looking at next steps, so timing of 18 months. Um, so with curriculum instruction, again, uh, looking at this from a layman's perspective, so right now we have K through four. If we were to move to K through five, um, and then a five, six, seven, eight, um, my assumption would be that there would only need to be significant changes to the, like the five and six uh, model. Um, and so the other, and then I guess this kind of goes hand in hand, is there, um, I don't want to say, I don't, I don't want to say expedite, but is there um, any way that, you know, that 18 month timeline may turn into 15 months or 16 months or 17 months or flip side, is there, is there potential for that to go the opposite direction where it goes from eight, instead of 18 months, it goes to 20 months or 24 months. Um, so yeah. So from a, from a curriculum perspective, I think your assumption is right that the greatest amount of work, time, effort, and change would be at the five, six level. I do think both the K-4 and the 7-8 levels should look at every opportunity to like look at what we're doing and how can we do this differently. Um, there may be elements of the six through eight school right now that are really designed to meet the needs of the really young students and we may be missing the boat on meeting the needs of some older students in a different way. Uh, I don't want to get into too many details, but we've actually talked about some of those details. In terms of the 18-month the piece, um, you know, uh, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, and I think this is kind of obvious, but maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's got to happen at the start of a school year, right? So I think when we sat in our committees and we started looking at the dominoes that need to fall, um, we thought it would be irresponsible um, uh, to try to do this by the start of the 23 school year. Um, and then, so then we said, okay, but could we do it by the start of the 24 school year? And the answer is yes, but if we want to involve families and um, teachers in a, in a, in a truly um, robust, multi-way conversation about what's best for our students and our, and our community, that takes time. So we need, the sooner that the board makes a decision, the sooner that all that can happen. So uh, sort of to get to the meat maybe in that question, Jonathan, if the board doesn't make a decision, say until May or June, I think we lose a lot of momentum to be, because then summer happens and we lose ability to do a lot of work with people that go off for vacation. I don't think it's fair to, to do that to both teachers and to families to sort of hide some, not that we would hide it, but people would miss out on it and that's not right. So, um, and we need to present a budget in, in September, October next year that would take this into consideration. So a lot of the decisions would need to be made before then. So yeah, I think it becomes either an 18 month or a 30 month pr process, you know what I mean? Like I think if the board doesn't make a decision within the next, you know, I would say in the early spring, we should probably plan on doing, in, unless we wanna rush it and then we just suffer the consequences of maybe not having the ability to engage the, the community. Thank you. Yeah, and the other thing we talked about, for instance, um, uh, fixing up, um, Let's, let's just say um, you're gonna move deep to Barca, fixing up that section of Barca first. Maybe the schools, maybe uh, school starts in 24 and the SAU is still, the SAU and we are still over there because we're really the last ones that have to move. And so we get deep, we fix up that area of Barca so that it's ready for deep. Then we can spend some time during the um, this fall of 24, where we're still in our building, uh, because then we're fixing up, and it would have to be stuff that, you know, we can't have jackhammers when the the kids are upstairs trying to study and stuff. But um, that's the idea that you know we could do it in some phases as well. But uh, you know, Derek sort of mentioned this way. It seems like a while ago, but earlier on about. We've got a, 
um, get moving as well because Jeremy will have to get going as far as talking to um, contractors and so forth because they get booked up so fast and the thought process would be we need some stuff done this summer um, to prepare probably. Uh, we definitely would need a lot done uh, the following summer. Does anyone else have any questions right now for the administration? I don't want to. If not, we I would suggest that any people keep looking at this over the next week or so and let people let the administration know as soon as possible if you have questions we will have facilities on the agenda on the 14th and we will discuss it and then if any if people want to take action at that time we can do that in public um, just try to get in any other questions you have sooner than later and I would suggest the administration that maybe give a shortened version of this presentation because or just give it again because people may not have tuned into this and we will have the public will have a chance at that point to ask questions as well, but hopefully they've watched this and seen some of our questions. Does anyone else have anything else for this meeting on facilities? So, I, I mean, I just, so hearing what Joe said about, you know, <clears throat> not wanting to rush it, um, and also it really being an eight, let's just say 23 or, or sorry, 24 or 25 timeline, um, I guess is what is our expectation for when we should um, can s start thinking about when we should be ready to make a decision um, one way or the other is this something that um, we I don't want to I don't want to come into the next meeting and, and again anybody can do this but a motion be made to do one thing or the other um, and then ne not necessarily expect to make a decision or to make a vote but um, I guess is is there I mean is there any other information that we need before we start making decisions other than comments uh, and input from the, the community um, for because obviously this is the first time that we've all uh, digested or taken this information so I understand there's a lot to digest but we've said this all along we need to be moving um, as quickly uh, and in a smart way as, as we possibly can so we this was meant to be a workshop because we can't make any decisions in a workshop we have to vote in public so the option is at any any meeting coming up we could discuss facilities and at any point make a decision how that goes is a matter of what the board wants to do if people would like to discuss it on the at the 14th and have and someone would like to make a motion then they could if it doesn't happen at that point it could happen at any of the next meeting so it's a matter of what people choose to do yeah, there, isn't, I, there isn't a set rule is what I agree. I'm saying yeah I guess I shouldn't have phrased it as a question I guess I should have posed it to you guys that hey you know if it's not next meeting then we need to start it should be the meeting after that that we start like really like the rubber meeting the road and, and having to make some decisions so um, I guess that's the comment I should have made as opposed to the question do you have a preference because the the of that that they give this presentation again at either the next meeting and we have a discussion and potentially vote or push it to the seventh what is your preference yeah I, um, because we're not meeting with the public before I, I would say I mean uh, and I think I, I don't know how I how what my thoughts are um, and there's still a lot more to digest and over the next couple weeks or the next I guess the next week uh, until our next meeting but I mean also I hope that the public does reach out between now and next week also they show up next week um, and they provide as much input as they can um, be open to conversations provide feedback uh, and you know I, I, again if it's not next week I think the next meeting we have to I, I would say what is that the first meeting in March or the second meeting in February I don't know so I would remind people watching this meeting that there is a there's a school board email and I'll be honest I don't remember what the general school board email is but we also all of our emails are listed on are listed on the website I did I did receive a couple of emails before this meeting but if people have input they should certainly email us and feel free to email us as a group so we all are looking we are looking for feedback Whenever we're going to vote, we need to be sure that the public knows. There ne it needs to be everywhere. Erica, that email address can be found on the members site of this of the website, and it's dcsd-schoolboard at sau10.org. Thank you. 
I think uh, my preference would be to vote on it next meeting. Um, just like many of our bigger decisions, we have either a workshop or something beforehand. The presentation has been posted for a little bit now. Um, and some of this material is goes back to 2017 and some of it's newer. Um, but as Austin said, um, it isn't going to pin the district. We're not spending any money with that vote right then and there. So the, the next sitting board could change that. But I think to give the district its best possible chance to move forward with this plan, if that is the will of the board at the time, um, it gives the administration time to start that. And it's not like it would be lost fruit of some sort. I think they're going to gain knowledge about fifth grade curriculum, sixth grade curriculum, seventh and eighth grade, K to four, whether we implement this, if, if the next board were to reverse this, if we said no and the next board said yes, or if we said yes and they said no, it doesn't make a difference. I think they're going to learn a lot about our curriculum and be able to implement um, in, in better curriculum moving forward. So if we made that decision next week, um, it only helps the district out by giving us time to start to study these ideas. So I would harken back to what Brenda said earlier, which is um, if it, if we put it on the agenda on the 14th, and I would suggest we do, and have the presentation allow the public to ask their questions and give their comments, and then after that we would deliberate, just make sure that we are very good about posting there. We have previously posted things on the library, the board, the electronic board outside the library, on the town website, in the town hall, in the Marion Garish Center, in all the schools, um, and I would not focus on the schools because there's a lot of people that, even parents that are not in or, in or out of the schools very often, but any community place that I may have left out that people can think of to make sure we get the word out. So I'm going to just list a few. Um, town has said no uh, for the website. So if somebody has a connection and uh, <laughs> might get somebody to say yes, uh, we got a no on posting on the website. Um, so I put a question mark on that. Um, library, um, Brenda, when you said posting at the town hall, is that just understood? Like, would Kathleen know that, or is it a specific, like, do we ask for a specific place or something? So they have a, um, they have a box, like a, a large box. They in the entrance lake? Yes. Okay. They, they post notices in there. They also post them on a, on a board sort of near where the, um, town clerk is. Town clerk as well? Um, so Austin, I would just say you may want to ask them why, and I'm going to say this in public because we posted on our website the survey they were conducting. This is affects our entire town, and we're trying to get the word out for people to come and learn. So we would like to know why our meeting that affects the town and its the buildings and cannot which, be posted on their okay, website. Which meeting it was, but what's that? It was the public hearing in the, that we had in the gym. Um, so uh, we will ask again, and um, uh, we will um, ask the second question if, it, if it's negative and say, could you give us a reason so that we can bring it back to the... And, and Yeah, and if, if they do say no, please let us know so we can make that public at the next meeting that they were not willing to help us advertise a meeting about the fut potential future of this town. Okay. And then I've got the, the box in the entrance of the town hall as well as near the town clerk. The library, I would assume there's one spot if you ask them. I think they've posted uh, a number of times. The library both inside and it has an electronic bulletin board outside that they've post they posted about that meeting. Austin, I think if um, Kathleen just sent it to Sheila, who's the secretary or the administrative Sheila. assistant for um, the town administrator, yep. she'll know what to do with it. Okay. Guys, I think we're kind of overcomplicating over this. I think we just need to be consistent and timely in all meetings, whether it's a uh, policy meeting or whatever it is. You just pick two places, our website, social media works. I don't think we need to overcomplicate this. We just need to pick two places, make it consistent, and make it timely, and I think we're good to go. And um, I just want to echo Derek's sentiments. I think my expectation is that we are prepared to vote on 214. And I think at this point, I don't see the need to drag it on, I guess is the word, but 
I just think we need to make a decision and move on. We, got a lot of bu we have a lot of business that we need to look forward to in this next year that have to be outside of facilities, and we just need to really focus on that, whether it's curriculum, policy, whatever the thing is, we'll talk about goals. We need to move forward, because there's a lot of work that needs to be done outside of what we spent the last year on. Does anyone have anything else for this meeting? If not, I would welcome a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries.